Well, I'm joined once again by Colin. He has come back down from Canada to talk about The Thing, the classic 2011 film starring Mary Elizabeth Winstead. No, I am, of course, joking. We're actually talking about John Carpenter's classic remake, Village of the Damned. No, I, actually, I should say uh, the, those were all jokes. We are not talking about those. We are talking about John Carpenter's film, The Thing, from 1982. Um, so with that being said, let's roll a clip of my favorite scene from The Thing. So yeah, we're going to talk about The Thing from yeah. 1982. Uh, last time you and I were on a discussion together, we talked about Blade Runner. Not only did The Thing come out the exact same day as Blade Runner, but it came out exactly 36 years ago to the day that we are filming this, which we didn't know until today. I just found this. I, somebody <laughs> tweeted this morning. Like, that can't be right. I'm like, oh my God. That's incredible. So that uh, that's like the second or third time that's happened on review. This is so fitting. But, yeah, yeah, I had no idea. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is one of my favorite movies of all time. I, I would say this is in uh, my top five. It's my favorite John Carpenter film of all time. Uh, it's, I know, not, it's not my personal favorite John Carpenter right, okay. movie, but I do think it's his best movie. You're an Escape from New York man. I, I love Escape from New York. Okay. I, it has flaws. It's just I, I personally connect with it a lot. Yeah. But the thing, just on like a, a technical level, a filmmaking level, yeah. this is John Carpenter at the top at of the his top craft. of his game. Yeah. I think this is like, yeah, from a technical standpoint, from directing uh, the way it's shot, everything. This is, I think, his best film. I think there was a screenplay by Bill Lancaster, who's Burt Lancaster's son, uh, going around. And initially, uh, Carpenter didn't want to do it. Um, and then he had to be kind of convinced, and once he sort of signed on. There was, a, early in the development of this, I think it was like late 70s, they were mm -hmm. trying to make a thing movie, and uh, originally attached was Toby Hooper. Really? Off of, off of, yeah, hot off of uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh my god, Toby I wonder Hooper if it was the same was, script. Uh, no, no, the script was by Kim Hinkle, who okay. wrote uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre with mm -hmm. Toby Hooper. Um, so it's a completely different movie, but another attempt to remake the thing. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, well, originally started with a 1938 uh, novella, a short story uh, by John W. Campbell Jr. Uh, it's called Who Goes There? And uh, I've read it, and I think the Carpenter movie is a lot closer to that short story than the 1951, The Thing from Another World, which was kind of like a corny 1950s monster movie. Look at me and know what I'm trying to tell you. I'm not your enemy, I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist who's trying... <laughs> It's like a big Frankenstein monster. He is, yeah. I think yeah. it's like James Arness and like a kind of, I think he was like a vegetable creature or something. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, and he's just sort of wandering around killing people and then they just electrocute it at the end. So I think, um, I read the short story and it is, it's very similar to the movie. So I think he kind of went back to the to the source. Well, yeah, his, his John Carpenter's The Thing is one of those movies when people complain about remakes and how bad remakes are. Mm -hmm. People always say, well, there are good remakes. Yeah. And then you say, what are they? And they say, The Thing? And you say, what else? And they say, the Usually fly. The fly. <laughs> and then you say, what else? And they say, invasion of the body snatchers? And which one? <laughs> yeah, which, <laughs> which, which one? one of the 25 remakes? Yeah. This is the kind of remake you need to do, you know, if you're going to, because uh, I know John Carpenter was a huge fan of the, the 1951. So much uh, so he had a cameo by it in uh, the original Halloween. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so he's obviously a big fan, but this is the way to do a remake where you kind of, you know, look at the original, go back to the source and do something completely different. Yeah. Uh, and improve on it. You don't want to remake, you know, who would, who would want to remake a good movie like John Carpenter's The Thing? <laughs> That's not a remake, that's a prequel, even though it has the exact same beats yeah, and everything like, is exactly the same. Some scenes are complete rip-offs. Like, <laughs> oh we'll, we'll get into we'll that. We'll get into that. We'll get into that. Um, but I guess uh, real quick, the basic premise of the movie, is there's this group of American researchers. So it's kind of a mix of characters. There's like the blue collar guys and I think like biology, uh, biologists and geologists. You got a, yeah, you got a doctor, you got uh, Wilford Brimley, who's like the head biologist and you know, so there are kind of like the, the nerdy side and then there's the blue collar guys like uh, Childs, uh, uh, Keith David. Mac wants the flamethrower. 
Mac wants the what? That's what he said, now move! Is this his first movie? No, it's not. I looked it up. His first movie was an uncredited uh, extra in a Disco Godfather, the Rudy really? Ray Moore film. Put your weight on it! Put your weight on it! Put your weight on it! So they're all up in Antarctica in this research facility. Just hanging out. Just hanging out. Playing chess. First, first playing goddamn playing, week of winter. Playing computer chess. Checkmate. Checkmate. She's a bitch. Yeah, well, the the the, uh, the only female character of the movie is a cameo by Adrian Barbeau's oh, voice. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, gets interrupted when a dog shows up from a nearby Norwegian research mm -hmm. facility. Uh, Norwegians are shooting at the dog. We don't know why. We don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. Turns out the dog is uh, an alien from outer space mm -hmm. that can transform into anything and replicate anything. Yeah. yeah. It's like a shapeshifter. It can sort of take the form of humans or whatever, whatever the hell. Yeah. And uh, so slowly over time, everybody starts to get paranoid, not know who's actually themselves and who's the thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody just gets exhausted and loses their mind trying to discover yeah. who or if any of them are the thing. And, and how to stop it. And how to stop it. Yeah, I've seen the movie a number of times mm -hmm. over the years and I've always really liked it. But yeah, the, the recent kind of Blu-ray re-releases made me really appreciate how fantastic this movie looks. Oh yeah. Uh, as far as the lighting. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is Dean Cundey, who worked yeah. with John Carpenter a lot, a lot through actually, the first yeah. half of his career, uh, and then left ways to go work with Spielberg and Zemeckis, yeah, and then he did eventually Dr Jurassic Park and Back to the Future. Jurassic Park, Back to the Future, Roger Rabbit. Oh uh, yeah, and then eventually he did Jack and Jill. What's my name? Dunkachino. It's a whole new game. Dunkachino. You want creamy goodness? I'm your friend. Say hello to my chocolate blend. That's well, most, you can't you can't win them all. That's the most depressing Hollywood story in the history yeah, of, I know, of I know. the industry. I think he works in commercials uh, now. I think some of the people that I work with have worked with him. He, well, he did go back because, yeah, Jack and Jill, that had to have been his point where he's like, I'm done. Yeah. All I'm, <laughs> I'm literally just pointing lights at people and washing everything out. Or he considered that the kind of high water mark of his career and he's like, I, <laughs> I can't, gonna get I can't do any this. better. <laughs> but uh, he did go back uh, and do like kind of like going back to his roots and mm -hmm. did like a uh, like a low-budget slasher movie called uh, The Girl in the Photographs. Oh, okay. Which isn't a great movie. It's yeah. all right. Cal Penn is in it, but uh, his cinematography is good. So It's fantastic. This movie is amazing. It's yeah. a shot. Uh, it's anamorphic. It's 239 aspect Classic ratio. Classic Carpenter aspect ratio. Mm. I know other filmmakers use that, but I always think of it as like the John Carpenter aspect yeah, ratio. Yeah, it's amazing. It's just... He really knows how to utilize a frame. Yeah, and you get all those, uh, what anamorphic does is it gives you all those like nice blue streaky light flares. Whenever they're sort of shining the flashlight in the lens, you get these like nice flares and it looks really great. Yeah. It looks it's very so, cinematic. So yeah, cinematic and atmospheric. <clears throat> and what I really noticed on this rewatch was the colors of the movie. Yeah. Which I never noticed before, really. Mm -hmm. Whenever they have a flare out, and you have this like uh, this contrast between these really deep blues and yeah. this like almost purple, yeah. like these highlights of purple. That was, you know, when I first saw the Blu-ray, like, holy shit, this looks fucking amazing. Like yeah. the detail, it looks like a, it could be released, you know, today, and you'd have no problem with it. Mm -hmm. And then the opening, uh, of course, is where we first hear the music. The, the theme, which can't, I sort of credit it to Ennio Morricone, um, but I think the theme was composed by John Carpenter. Well, that, that's the interesting thing about the score is like, yeah, Ennio Morricone, he's worked on all these movies and he's a classic composer. Mm -hmm. And then his score for this movie is just a John Carpenter score. And you're like, wait a minute. It's just some tones. <laughs> don't, don't. Um, but I think what the situation was is, you know, yeah, he had a pretty big budget. It was like $15 million, which was pretty big at the time. Uh, so I think he felt, okay, he could like sort of outsource the music at least so he could concentrate on everything else. Um, so we got Ennio Morricone, but the movie took a very long time to finish. So I think Ennio Morricone uh, saw a rough cut uh, of the movie with like unfinished effects and stuff. And just from the notes that Carpenter was giving him, sort of composed all this orchestral uh, score and pieces uh, and gave it to Carpenter. So and said like, feel free to sort of edit it and sort of place it around the movie mm. as you see fit. Yeah, I know, I know Carpenter went in with uh, Alan Howarth, who he's yeah. worked with a few times to kind of piece in some other bits here and there. Yeah. yeah, but it was amazing just sort of watching the Blu-ray. I don't know if it's just the audio was a lot better uh, than the copies that I've seen before, but I really, I'm like, wow, I didn't like remember all this sort of orchestral um, yeah, music throughout the movie. It, it's never like John Carpenter always refers to his scores as wallpaper. He never yeah. wants it to like 
inform the scene or uh, kind of manipulate the scene mm -hmm. like some other filmmakers do, where the score is really what drives the, the, the feeling or the emotion of the scene. Yeah. He always wants it to just kind of create an atmosphere. And so it's always in the background. It mm -hmm. just kind of lulls you in. Yeah, I guess which sort of like he, he couldn't really drive the scene if he's not composing to the actual movie, you know what I mean? So he's sort of giving him stuff that he can just sort of pepper in here and there. Yeah. Uh, so I think there ended up being a lot of unused Ennio Morricone music, which uh, Tarantino actually used in The Hateful Eight. What works about this movie is that it uh, functions on two like really kind of like primal fears, which oh, yeah. is like isolation and paranoia. Yeah, uh, and that's very, what the movie is. Bleak like, and yeah, and it's of course it's thought of as a, a, a big like practical effects heavy movie, which I'm sure we'll get into. Yeah, mm -hmm. but there are long stretches of the movie where mm -hmm. it's just these characters and yeah, they do great. not trust each other, and they're just like kind of losing their mind because they're in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. in the dead of winter. Who's that? Yeah, this is like, uh, I think the definition of a slow burn, Yeah, which I love. I love slow burn movies. You're, you're with these characters in these sort of like dark and cold hallways. And, and it just builds and builds and yeah. builds and builds and it's just amazing. You gotta be fucking kidding. What the movie does really well that the prequel does not, which mm -hmm. we'll get into. We keep saying we'll get into the prequel and all we're gonna do is talk about it for two minutes I know, and say it I sucks. Know. But, uh, we don't know who the thing is for most of the movie. We do have that scene where the dog going down the hallway you, goes you into- suspect something is wrong because of the, weird about the, the dog. way it's behaving. We, we don't know what yet, but you see it go into a room and we just see the silhouette of one of the characters. We don't know who it is yet. That's right, yeah. And uh, I think Carpenter didn't want anybody to be able to identify the character by the silhouette. So I don't think that silhouette is actually played by any of the actors in the movie. It was somebody else. <laughs> So yeah, he's sort of like planting all these little, like, uh, little moments. Mm -hmm. First goddamn week of winter. Uh, technically it's an ensemble cast, but you know, Kurt Russell sort of, I think, emerges as the protagonist as the movie goes on. He's the one you root for because he's Kurt Russell. Yeah, exactly. And he has the, the most amazing beard and a giant sombrero. And a great intro. It's like he's playing this uh, computer chess. Yeah. Well, I, I'm assuming that computer, because I think it says like chess wizard on the side. Like so that is a computer that exists solely. Only for chess wizard. Wouldn't it be better just to have like a chess board or something? Wouldn't that be cheaper? <laughs> Computers back then, this is 82. That thing was probably like $40,000. <laughs> he just destroyed it. That's government property. What if somebody else wanted to play chess after that? Like, God damn it, Kurt Russell. So how's this motherfucker wake up after thousands of years in the ice? And how can it look like a dog? I don't know how. Cause it's different than us, see? Cause it's from outer space. What do you want from me? Ask him. Kurt Russell in all the John Carpenter movies, he's like very different, completely different and very distinct. <laughs> yeah. Like obviously in Escape from New York, he's kind of doing a uh, Clint Eastwood Clint impression. Eastwood, yeah. About an hour ago, a small jet went down inside New York City. The president was on board. President of what? Big Trouble in China, he's doing a John Wayne impression. Yep. Have you paid your dues, Jack? Yes, sir, the check is in the mail. But, but here he's just, Affable Kurt Russell. Yeah, he's just, just cool and badass. Yeah. And then he played Elvis. That's the one Carpenter thing I haven't seen. That really? was like a made-for-TV movie. Yeah, and... it's really good. It ends on a, a, a shot of Elvis on stage, and uh, he freezes as the camera like continues to move around him. So it's like kind of technically the first bullet time oh. shot in any movie, but it's just practical. It's just Kurt Russell like Same holding still. still. <laughs> and it goes on for a long time. So, so it's like the end of every episode of Police Squad? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Frank, when will people learn that crime doesn't pay? Well, I suppose if they do learn, we'll be out of a job. I'm not gonna harm anybody, and there's nothing wrong with me. And if there was, I'm all better now. I'd like to come back inside. Now you got my promise. Wilfred Brimley is in this movie. It's everyone's, really weird to, to see without his mustache. <laughs> it's very strange. It looks unnatural. I, I thought he was the thing through the whole movie, just because I was like, that's not really Wilfred Brimley. <laughs> 
But uh, he's great in it as Blair. Yeah, he's really good. Every, everybody's good in it. But then Richard Mazur is uh, the Clark. Clark, who's kind of in charge of this group of dogs. Yeah, he's like the dog keeper, sort of. Yeah. And he's, and he's really weird, too. He's like a kind of, I guess he sort of identifies more with the dogs than he does the people. He seems like yeah. very isolated. He's, yeah, he seems like very sensitive about the dogs. He's like and, a loner. Yeah. You, you get that feeling. And that's what's, I, I think, important to bring up is that, like, one, this is a, a small cast. It's mm -hmm. an all-male cast. They spend good portions of the movie where they're all wearing parkas, mm -hmm. where it could be, which actually kind of goes into the theme of not knowing who's really who. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody's really well defined without having to do much just because they're so well cast. Yeah, and even just like the first couple of scenes, like in the intro, like from that kind of shootout and like Gary like breaks the window and he starts yeah. shooting and just like everybody's interactions. And I think um, they did rehearsal before this and they kind of spent a lot of time together. So I think it's like that kind of bonding shows. Yeah, but it's, uh, but it's great because there's no like a, a extensive exposition or no. overly explaining who these people are, but you still get a sense of of everybody's personality really quickly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is funny because you look at something else to bring up is you look at reviews from this movie at the time. Mm, Not only man. was this, there's plenty of really great movies that did poorly As, at the as box like Blade office. Runner. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but the difference is Blade Runner got good reviews, right? I don't think so. Oh, I think it? maybe some. Okay, because I feel like this movie got like savaged. Uh, there's, lots did, of, yeah. there's lots of good movies that did poorly at the box office, mm -hmm. but this is one that did poorly at the box office and was critically panned. Oh my God, I'm just which reading like, some of those reviews are just like it's, ridiculous. It's like criminal. People are angry. <laughs> how, how did you get this so wrong? Yeah. The Thing is basically just a geek show, a gross out movie in which teenagers can dare one another to watch the screen. John Carpenter's The Thing is a foolish, depressing, overproduced movie that mixes horror with science fiction to make something that is fun as neither one thing or the other. Instant trash! But uh, one of the common complaints about the movie was that there's no characters, it's just like a, like a gore fest, and it's... Not true. There's so much craft in this movie, and there's so many great performances that really inform all the characters, so... Uh, specifically, if you pay attention, if you pay attention, and I think I think the the gore is just so over the top uh, well, that, that it probably just overshadowed everything. Oh. Oh. And then the movie comes out and it flops horribly. Oh my god! This is definitely the start of John Carpenter's kind of disillusionment with Hollywood. I think so. That like, he's yeah. never recovered from. <laughs> yeah, because I think this is like he said, this is his favorite movie of all the movies that he's done. Mm. Um, you know, this could have been a big thing for him had it been a, a huge hit, I think. You know, this was like a big chance for him with like, you know, a big budget. Yeah. And unfortunately, it flops, so, you know. Yeah, people always, when they talk about this movie flopping, they always bring up, because this came out in the summer of 82, which mm -hmm. was the summer of uh, Blade Runner, uh, Conan the Barbarian, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, tons of big movies. Yeah. Um, uh, also, the summer of E.T., which came out a couple weeks earlier. And I think that was the reason that... Well, that's... I, I don't know. People always say that. Like, oh, E.T. came out, and that was like a cute little alien, and right after that, people don't want to see this ugly, like... Disgusting. Nihilistic movie with yeah. this creepy, disgusting alien. Um, and it's like, I don't know. It's kind of aiming for a different audience yeah. than E.T. audience. Like, I don't know if that's the reason it flopped. I think it might have just been bad timing and a, a crowded summer with all these big movies. Yeah, but, um, but you think about the release now, this would have done better, I think, like, you know, in October or kind of yeah. fall release. It's very odd when you think about how the release schedules go now. Like, seeing something like this in the summer is very weird. Yeah, and that's why we started talking about the cast, but I wanted to mention Richard Mazur as Clark, because mm -hmm. he's in charge of the dogs, and he kind of uh, uh, ushers in this dog from the Norwegian camp. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the dog kennel scene, like that's where things go crazy. Well, this sort of like dog sits down in the middle of the kennel, and you can, he's got like this thousand yard stare. And it's, it's the best performance it's by a dog. Amazing acting in a movie. by a dog. It's so incredible. It's, you just know something's, you know, and the dogs, all the other dogs are getting kind of creeped out by it. Which I guess is like, you know, we got to talk about Rob Bottin. Like this movie is sort of held as like the holy grail of practical effects. Yes. I think, and they, they are fantastic. Uh, yeah, and it all, it's, it's a, again, going back to like the cinematography, it's a combination of, yeah, the, the effects are all practical. Mm -hmm. There's like a couple optical shots throughout the movie. But I think at the very end. Yeah, uh, well, there, it, well, well there's, there's some like, matte paintings. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, this is sort of like an every trick in the book movie. There's yeah. matte paintings, there's stop motion, which is the weakest part of the effects. <laughs> 
And not just the effects, the whole movie, but specifically the, or especially the effects is like lots of, lots of hard shadows, mm -hmm. lots of dark areas, uh, just glimmers on certain aspects yeah. of the, you know, little shafts of light. To, so you get an idea of what's happening without it just being overly lit so mm -hmm. it looks like a big rubber thing. But even when, it, you know, in later scenes, like the kind of uh, defibrillation scene, uh, it is better lit and yeah. stuff like that, but it, it's still, it's very artfully done and, you know. Especially the kennel scene where it's oh, just Oh man, like, that's just all and it's sort of dark and it's just... Uh, well, I don't think I ever noticed until this Blu-ray release, like, because the dog, this is where it reveals itself as the thing because mm. it's going gonna, it's gonna to start incorporating all the other dogs. Mm -hmm. Face opens up like a flower. Yeah. I never noticed before that like the skull of the dog head just kind of falls out. <laughs> this scene is sickening. Like it's so <laughs> gross. And you know it's like every cut, every angle is a different gag that yeah. they had to rig up. So it's like all these shots in combination together yeah. with that lighting. Like it's all just like seamless. It's fantastic. Uh, but Rob Bottin, so uh, we got to talk about him. He was 23 when he did this movie, which is just blows my mind. I can't think of anything I did worthwhile at 23, <laughs> let alone like- I can't think of anything I've done worthwhile ever. But this particular, while we're on the kennel scene, uh, this was an overwhelming movie for Rob Bottin and it became an issue later uh, in production or in post-production, I should say. Um, so he kind of needed help and he brought on help. Uh, so Stan Winston actually helped out on the dog kennel scene. Hmm. Um, just because to sort of take some work off of Rob Bottin's, you know, load, give him. So it's actually, I think the dog, when it sort of comes up and opens its mouth, that's oh, actually yeah. Stan Winston's arm. He's oh, like underneath okay. the floor, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if he did the entire sequence or just sort of helped out here and mm. there, but. But yeah, it's like, I mean, and there are certain parts where like, yes, you could tell it's an animatronic thing. Mm -hmm. It's a rubber thing, but like the but lighting- it looks, it looks real. Yeah, the lighting helps. I mean, it looks like slimy and it, there's this like- guy, It's like spraying all this jizz all over the dogs. Yeah, and yeah. It's like, and I'm, I'm not like an anti-CG person or whatever. Yeah. You can do amazing things, but like, even, even if you can do something more fluid in the CG, <laughs> It's not the same. It, it doesn't have that like tangible, real, just goo quality and where gross, it's like, yeah, like gross quality. You like you see that there, even if you know it's a puppet or if you know it's some sort of animatronic yeah. thing, like it feels real because you know it was there. Yeah, and it just sort of keeps unfolding and all of these new disgusting, <laughs> disgusting things. Well, that's the cool thing about the thing is that you never, there's never like a, a final form no. or a normal form. You don't know what the hell it looks we like. Don't, we have no, maybe it doesn't have a normal form because yeah. it's just like constantly changing. But that, that kind of flower petal thing you were talking about, it has all the teeth on it. Yeah. But the individual petals, I didn't know this, are actually dog tongues. Oh my God, it's, it's that's fucking amazing. disgusting. <laughs> I never knew that. It's so disgusting. Oh, wow. Oh, that scene. And it is, like, I, I know the critics complained that it was too kind of, like, ugly and mean-spirited and yeah. nihilistic. And it is, but yeah. it's a horror film. It's a horror film. movie. It's not, it's not a feel-good um, film. I mean, there are parts that are like like when they're uh, the dog kennel scene again, where yeah. it's like they show up and they start shooting all the dogs. And oh, it's yeah. Like, oh, oh, my this God. Is harsh, but... I mean, that's the situation they're in. Them's that, the brakes. That's exactly like you. <laughs> what like are you gonna you, do? Yeah, you completely understand the situation they're in because that would lead them to kind of go to those extreme measures of yeah. one shooting the dogs, but then turning on each other as well. Yeah. Uh, Wilford Brimley is the smartest character in the movie. Yeah, he kind of figures um, it out, and I think this is the only sort of scene that could. Uh, well, there's like a couple scenes of like exposition. Um, he sort of figures it out on his, his very 1980s computer. Well, I wanted to mention that because I think, I think I've seen people say that that, um, that sequence was sort of created in editing. Yeah. How there was more like just dialogue and exposition mm -hmm. trying to explain all this stuff. And then they just took existing shots of Wilford Brimley at this computer, mm -hmm. cut to the magical exposition computer program. Of it sort of showing uh, the, yeah, know, how, yeah. how the thing, the thing kind of assimilates and... Exposition.exe. You kind of have to brush off the fact that whatever that program doesn't really make any sense. That's like, how would that exist? That's definitely not Chess Wizard that they're, they're <laughs> playing. That'd be funny. It's like, all right, we got to like figure out the assimilation pattern. Where's the Chess Wizard? <laughs> God damn it, Kurt Russell! Kurt Russell! <laughs> Son of a bitch! <laughs> That's the fifth Chess Wizard you've ruined. <laughs> 
Uh, but yeah, they just took like existing footage and then shot some inserts of the computer monitor. Like, boom, we yeah. get it. Like, it's 30 yeah, seconds you, long. You don't need much. Yeah. Well, that, that's the thing people like to kind of analyze or debate is at yeah. what point mm -hmm. he's he's uh, infected because by the end we know he is. Right. Um, but what I love is that once he kind of runs the computer program that explains everything, he just trashes that room. He goes insane. <laughs> And it could be taken, uh, I think, two ways, which is one, he doesn't want the, the rest of the people to have communication with the outside world mm -hmm. because he's the thing and he wants to take them over, or he wants to cut them off so that the thing can't get out further. Yeah, I think you see him later on, he sort of cuts the cables in the helicopter, he destroys the helicopter yeah, and, the, yeah. and the, the cat, I think the sort of... But watching Wilford Burnley vehicle. fuck up that room... It wanted to be us! He's got <laughs> I get you! And he's like, I kill you! <laughs> <laughs> he swings that axe, and I swear to God, when Kurt Russell rushes him with the table, oh, yeah, yeah. and the axe goes right through the table. I don't know, that seems like a real axe. Forgot his insulin, <laughs> some diabetic freak out. <laughs> but uh, I've always kind of assumed that he wasn't the thing at that point, because then, because he's freaking out, they, they lock him in the shack outside. <laughs> hey, Blair! I don't want to stay out here anymore. I want to come back inside. And they come to visit him later, and he's like, I'm all right, I can come back in, but hanging in the foreground is a noose. <laughs> like, he's just going to take his life at some point because of, he's losing his mind out there. I think maybe he had been slowly infected. He just sort of does the autopsy at the beginning, which is another disgusting scene. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we got to talk about that because that has, I don't know why there aren't more gifs, reaction gifs of Wilford Brimley's <laughs> face from that scene. Oh. 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 Yeah, it's like somebody farted. <laughs> and that scene ends, multiple scenes in this movie end on Wilford Brimley making a face like that. Yeah. Like, and then freeze frame mm. and fade to black. There's like There's two a lot of, yeah, fade to black, yeah. which is very interesting to editing technique. Which yeah, I think it, the editor said he kind of got shit for. Or oh, really? He was kind of mocked by fellow editors because they're like, nobody uses fade to black. So yeah, it's it's very old fashioned, but so is John Carpenter as, as yeah. far as his filmmaking influences go. Um, Slither, the James Gunn movie Slither, has lots of fades to black too. I, I don't I know if I think it a... works so well in this in this oh, movie. Yeah. It's like this little passage of time and you know, a little chapter kind of. Well, it, it adds and... to the yeah, like we're still here. Like everybody in the movie is so exhausted. Yeah, they start exhausted just because they're in the middle of nowhere and, and they're then... watching the prices right or yeah. like, let's make a deal. You and know, then, I know how this one ends. And then you throw like this thread on top of that. Yeah. and I mean Kurt Russell is perfect when he's got his little tape recorder. And he's like everybody's tired. Nobody trusts anybody now. We're all very tired. That's one comment that I thought was funny. There was, uh, you know, being savage in the reviews, but uh, the director of the original, of The Thing from Another World, was just so disgusted with this movie. <laughs> and he says it's just a goddamn, like, commercial for J&B. <laughs> <laughs> Which it kind of is. I sure it's probably the worst commercial for J and B. I know. I don't know. <laughs> Kurt Russell's drinking and he looks pretty cool. That's true. Him and he is the one that survives. Yeah. Maybe the J and B contributed to that. There you go. That's a perfect commercial. <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 J and B. It's like Kurt Russell's Mentos. <laughs> That's it's just right. J and B. <laughs> you see, when a man bleeds, it's just tissue. My blood from one of you things won't obey when it's attacked. It'll try and survive. Crawl away from a hot needle, say. So there is one other kind of important uh, set piece scene, and that's the blood test scene. Yes, as you were talking about, Kurt each Russell individual could, cell is its own thing. Yeah, so. Kurt Russell kind of comes up with this theory. He's like, you know, I, I sort of saw that head running away, and I got the idea that, you know, each individual part of it. So he's going to do this blood test. He's going to tie people up that he thinks are the thing, and then, you know, people that he can kind of trust. And he's going to draw blood from everybody. I guess you're okay. Fantastic scene. The, the, it, it's, it's perfectly executed tension. Yeah. It's so well paced and it's it it goes on just long enough where even if you've seen the movie before, mm -hmm. you kind of, uh, it goes on long enough where you kind of forget when the scare happens. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So when it does, like it's still effective. Oh, it's great. I thought you'd feel that way, Gary. You were the only one that could have got to that blood. We'll do you last. <laughs> 
like I always complain about cheap jump scares in movies. Mm -hmm. I think when I mention jump scares, people assume that I think like all jump scares are created equal. No, They're this is not. earned. <laughs> you have to earn a jump. You can use jump scares, but it has to be earned yeah. and it has to have a point. This isn't like and, a cat uh, being thrown at someone. From exactly. It's just a loud noise that startles you after moments of silence. And it works so well because the scene is so kind of like quiet up to that point. And they all, I think they all like kind of want to kill Kurt Russell at this stage. Yeah. Um, well, at one they, point they think he's they think the thing. He's, the they, thing. They, they, he's locked outside. He gets back in. Yeah. So he's he's you know doing this test while he's still got the flamethrower. Everybody's flame just lost their minds. Oh my god, it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, the shot where the thing you know jumps out of the the petri dish. Mm -hmm. It's shot in a way where it's like, okay, that was probably a fake hand. Oh yeah, it was a fake up. hand, I think. But uh, but what's great is they use that shot before that in that sequence, that exact same angle. <laughs> So you're accustomed to seeing it, which makes it even more of a surprise when yeah. something happens because you see that shot and like at least, you know, me kind of thinking of like the filmmaker mind yeah. is like, oh, and that shot, that hand might be fake, so something's going to happen. But then nothing happens and then yeah. they use that shot again and nothing happens. Yeah, I didn't know. I looked it up afterwards and I didn't know it was a fake hand, so mm -hmm. it works for me. Yeah, it makes sense. Probably a hole underneath it and you shoot something mm -hmm. up through. But by using that shot a few times, like it, it kind of lulls you in. So it, it, you, you don't notice a difference, like a jump. Exactly. Uh, yeah. If that was the first time they cut to that shot, yeah. you'd be like, well, that's an effect shot. Yeah. But the fact that it's incorporated earlier just really sells the whole thing. Uh, so Dean Cundy gave every character that was tied down a little, a little eye light, which is, you know, very common in movies. Uh, it's just a little glint, a little highlight that sort of like, you know, gives the give, gives life to the character, to the eyes. The only character that doesn't have an eye light is Palmer, and he's one of the things. So that was like a very subtle kind of clue if you kind of pick up on it. Hmm. He has these like very kind of deep set black eyes, but. Uh, and then instantly, yeah, he like splits up and comes <laughs> and this thing. splits open. He just fucking bites the guy. The whole scene is like so chaotic. It's and then he amazing. Flapped, he he flings a dummy around <laughs> yeah, that's a little right. bit. Like, Not the best effect of the movie, but yeah, it's but quick. That works. Uh, the funny thing, one of the funny thing was, was like Palmer sort of like splits apart and he starts going crazy and then I think McCready kind of torches him. Yeah. And then he bursts through the wall. That wall is like, it's like two inches thick. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it just looks like it's cardboard and it's like, like they would be freezing. It's not even insulated. <laughs> Look, this research facility, they blew all their money on the chess wizards. They have a closet full of chess wizards. They don't have they don't have the budget for insulation. God damn it, McCready. Mm. Clear! Clear. There's some amazing sequences we kind of brushed over earlier, which the big one being the defibrillator scene, mm -hmm. which is just same with the dog kennel scene where it's like every shot is a different effect. Yeah. So it's not just like you have to create this one gag. It's like an it's endless just series layers of gags and layers and layers. Every shot, the effect has to be able to do something different. Yeah. Um, but talking about jump scares, that is fucking amazing. That yes. Is so yes. well executed. Clear. And it's crazy, there's like one shot, it's like a second long where yeah. his arms are ripped off. And that wide it's shot. It's the wide shot, yeah. They cast a guy who's missing his arms and put a mask of the actor on him for yeah. just like one second of film. And you don't notice it. If you kind of pause it and look, yeah, it kind of doesn't look like him. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I never noticed that until I kind of read about it. But there you go. It's all it's, it's all old school trickery. Yeah. Um, and then just the visual is so bizarre when like the spider legs come out. Yeah, it's like almost like before. It's like the dog kennel scene where it's like before you can even kind of settle in and kind of like uh, deal with what you've just seen. There's yeah. like some other more disgusting thing that happens. If I had any complaints about the movie, and it's very minor, is that I feel like the, the conclusion is a little weak. The um, oh, this, when they go to find Blair in the cabin, and then they kind of explore the yeah, the they're going. Tunnels. I mean, that's that stuff's all fine. There's mm -hmm. some tension and stuff, but then when we see the full creature, the kind of like big reveal, I guess. It's a big reveal, and then it's just Kurt Russell just kind of blows it up. Yeah, fuck you too. I mean, it, it kind of works in that it doesn't go too over the top, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, it's just sort of like a desperation, like we got this dynamite, I'll throw that. Yeah. Um, 
but it's, it's I don't know, a little, no, a little I, I, I don't mind it. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll give it a pass because this movie I, is I'm, so fucking awesome. Oh, yeah, exactly. I'm and not... then it sort of just leads into, you know, this awesome, awesome ending with him and Keith David. How will we make it? Maybe we should. If you're worried about me. If we've got any surprises for each other. I don't think we're in much shape to do anything about it. The, the bleak ending, which people love to debate. But what I, what I, it's funny because people always like try to debate like or, or find clues on if he's yeah. really the thing or not. The whole point of the ending is it doesn't, we don't know and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, yeah. That that paranoia is still there and, and that, that's where we end. Yeah, again, Dean Cundy sort of came back to that kind of eye highlight uh, clue that he did in the, in the blood test scene. Mm. And then he asked Carpenter, he's like, are we going to do the same thing? And Carpenter said, no, don't do it. I want it to be ambiguous. Yeah. Uh, yeah, people say you can't see child's breath, yeah. which is bullshit. It's, you can. <laughs> he does. He kind of leans forward and you see it. You see an eyelid in both of them, you know. And even if, you know, he was the thing, it would be a perfect copy of him. He would be breathing and yeah. you'd have breath. So that's all BS. Everybody, you know, this and that. Carpenter yeah. said. I mean, if you have fun trying to find this stuff, I guess, whatever. But the, Someone, it, it, I'm sure there's theories. It where, kind of defeats the purpose, exactly. which is that we don't know and we're not supposed to know. And yeah. it, it almost doesn't matter because either way, these guys are fucked. What do we do? Why don't we just wait here for a little while? See what happens. I read some crazy crackpot review. He's like, you know, Kurt Russell hands him the JMB, but it's really the gasoline. Oh, from Jesus. The, and you know, Childs didn't react when he drank it, so that means he's the thing. It's like, <sighs> oh man. No, 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 no. It's no. meant to be ambiguous. We're not meant to know. Neither of them are the thing. But that, <laughs> <laughs> definitively. <laughs> Uh, but also, this will lead into our discussion of the 2011 uh, film. Man, oh also man. in that scene, though, at the end, this is how we know that Childs is not the thing, mm -hmm. because you briefly, he has an earring, and you briefly see the earring. That's right. And as we learn from the prequel... I think they're fillings from someone's teeth. It can clone cells, but not inorganic material. It couldn't copy these, so it spit them out. So the prequel answer, answered the question of the original film, and then that Childs is not the thing. Did we really need to know that? <laughs> Fucking pre prequels, man, I'm telling you. Yeah, well this prequel in particular is 2011. Um, it's more a remake than anything. It's just yeah. called The Thing. Um, it's even called The Thing. Yeah, exactly. And it is a poor imitation, I might add. <laughs> hey, there you go. But uh, what it really does is ruin the first half of the original movie because yeah. The whole thing is the whole thing in the thing is the the mystery of like what's happening. Yeah, like, why are these Norwegians chasing this dog? What's the deal with this dog? Uh, when they're exploring the base, you know, yeah, the they explore base. the base where oh, the Norwegians awesome. came from. And... You can kind of piece it together in your mind. Maybe they found a fossil. The remains of some animal buried in the ice, and they chopped it up. But where is? Remember mystery? <laughs> so the prequel, if you watch the prequel before going into the original film, like all that's ruined. I made a horrible mistake. I watched the thing first, and then I watched the prequel second. Oh no. And I think you did the opposite, which I was did the, the smart opposite. thing. I, I saw the thing back when it, the, the prequel, back when it first came out. And yeah. I was like, wow, this sucks, moving on. Um, so I hadn't watched it since, but then in preparation for this, I rewatched it, and then I watched the John Carpenter one right afterwards. And it's, it just, yeah, it just completely deflates the first half of the John Carpenter movie. I did the opposite, and I just went to bed angry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it couldn't be more glaringly obvious, how, like, how bad it is. And... Yeah, and then, of course, uh, very famously, all the effects in it were done practically, and then the producers were like, oh, this doesn't look modern enough. Yeah, there's sort of theories about what happened. Uh, I, I know friends that actually worked on the CG. Mm. Um, one of them knew I was a huge fan of the thing. He was working on the CG and he, he's like, look, you know, uh, they're replacing, because that was, they were sort of touting it as big return to sort of practical effects. And I've seen some of them. You can find them online, a lot of the behind the scenes. I yeah, think, they're uh, all on YouTube. Um, for whatever reason, my friend said that the producer or the director, probably the producer, uh, weren't happy with how the practical effects uh, came out, or they thought it looked like a very dated movie. It was too retro. So they made the that come out a few years later. Everyone would have been okay with it because yeah. retro is the new thing. It's the new thing, mm, yeah. capturing the spirit of the '80s movies. Yeah. So uh, for some reason, they made the decision to replace 
everything with with CG, and <sighs> it is not good CG. It's too fluid. It looks cartoony, um, especially in contrast with the first movie. But it's also the thing is willing to show itself in every possible moment to give itself it. away. It makes yeah. no sense. It's like, you know, it usually would wait. And the good thing about the Carpenter film is like you rarely ever see the attacks if it's just uh, uh, one other person that it's attacking. Yeah. You would only see it when it's cornered, you know, by a bunch of people and it's trying to escape. But in right. this movie, it, it's like it, it, it like panics almost. It goes out of its way to attack somebody when somebody else is present. Yeah. It gives itself away at any opportunity. <laughs> it is so annoying. And it's like for all the sort of forensic recreation of what happened at the Norwegian base, like, yeah. you know, here's how that axe got there, and here's how so-and-so cut their throat or whatever like that. It's like they ignored everything else about the Carpenter movie about how to build tension and how this kind of creature behaved. Yeah. It's just very odd. It's just a, like a complete fundamental misunderstanding of the original movie. Absolutely, on every single level. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, even going so far as to call it the thing, it's like, fuck you. Yeah. The, in, uh, I well, read that's, the, that's the thing with, with soft reboots or prequels or whatever, you just call it the same thing as the original. They said they, they couldn't come up with a better name, so they, that's how they just chose the thing. But that's now like, you know, the new Halloween, speaking of John Carpenter, the yeah. new Halloween that's coming out. It's just Halloween. Mm. Mm. You recognize that name. So that's, that's the trends. When they do the, uh, the soft reboot of Gremlins, where they bring back uh, Billy Peltzer for like two scenes mm -hmm. just to appease the original fans. Gremlins. The movie's just gonna be called Gremlins. You know, it's like these Prometheus movies and all those things. Yeah. Something. Yeah, that's or, sort of like the precursor to the, the Ridley Scott Alien prequels. Just where it's like, we don't everything. need this. We don't I don't want to know what the space jockey is. And it's yeah. just like, you know, for years since I saw that movie, you kind of have like this vision in your head of what it is or where it came from. And that's what's great. It opens your imagination Everyone, when they're when yeah. they're exploring the Norwegian camp, and you see all this chaos. And, and you're, you you're just... reconstructing in your head, like, wow, what could have happened here? Yeah. And it's amazing. That kind of mystery is these fucking prequels can fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> it is ruin everything. I don't want to know.